Intention, which is dipping the bread into the wine, is actually the germiest way to share the wine in Holy Communion. And no, there is not enough alcohol content in the wine we use to take care of that. So we will not be offering intention as an option. The glasses in the tray are checkerboarded, so they are in every other slot to help cut down on the possibility of you having to touch multiple glasses when you're picking up a glass. And we are using disposable plastic cups as well. So, um, If the small glasses, however, are hard for you to handle, I know that's something that for some folks, those little glasses are hard to handle. It is fine to skip the wine or juice. It is still fully communion. Jesus is still present if you just take the bread and skip the wine or juice. Being together for worship is really important. Um, but so is loving our neighbor and doing what we can to help keep each other safe and our healthcare system from being overwhelmed. Church leaders met this morning right before this worship service to make some decisions about what we will be yeah what we will be doing going forward. This will be communicated in as many methods as we um, have available to us and so you will be getting email and uh, check Facebook and uh, you know however else we can get things out for you but so that you know, these are the decisions for now. As you've probably heard every place else, this is changing quickly and frequently. And so because this is the decision for today, does not guarantee it will be the decision for next week or the week after. But um, as soon as anything changes, we will again get word out to you in as many different forms as we have available to us. For now, yes, we will continue to have worship services here at Grace. It is important for us to be together. It is important for us to have a safe space and time to be together with other people. That, um, and we are well below the um, restrictions that have been put out so far for gatherings um, of people. However, we are discontinuing having um, Wednesday soup suppers and coffee hour. So bring your own coffee if you, if you need coffee in the morning. And enjoy the abundance of treats that Noreen has for us today because this is the last one for a while. We will still have worship on Wednesday nights, just not supper. So worship at 7 o'clock. There will be no Sunday school classes from now until after Easter, nor will the nursery be available or staffed. Uh, committee meetings, board meetings, other group meetings that happen here at the church during the week, will continue at the um, decision of the group or board involved. So, and again, we'll get this information out to everybody so um, you can make some decisions around that. Um, if you're able to and choose to meet by conference call or video conference or you know other methods, that is fine. But most of these are smaller gatherings and um, you can make your own choices about those. Again, we're going to try to get a word out to you in as many different ways as possible. However, if you're not sure about what's happening, please call or email the church office. Call or email me um, or text me. I will be getting... Let's see, my home phone number is in your bulletin every week. It's on the back page in the fine print that you probably never read, um, but it's in there. I will be also getting my cell phone number out to everybody. Don't look for it on Facebook, though. I'm not posting it that publicly. Um, but I will get that out along with the letter and other communication that we're going to try to put together in the next couple of days. Um, 
So call or email. Um, please do not rely on Facebook as a way to reach us at the church. Okay. Um, our church Facebook page is um, only is not always checked regularly. I do not have Facebook on my phone, and so we do not get Facebook Messenger um, on a regular or, or um, routine basis. So please don't rely on Facebook as a way to reach us. Joanne. We don't check the Grace email a great deal on the weekends, nor has it been a good practice to um, look at the caller messages on the weekends. So try to contact her. Call me. Text her. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah, call or text me or email me. Yes, that's a good reminder. Um, I We do not always check the church voicemail on the weekends or the church um, email. So, um, on the weekends, yes. Sorry, we, we check it. You know, I am so confused at this point that I am. So, it's good that you all are here to help keep me on track. So... And please check up on each other. You know, this is, this is the time for us to be the church. And so if someone's been absent for a bit, you've noticed, please call them. See how they're doing. See if they need anything. Um, if you're not able to help with what they need, we will try to connect people with um other volunteers who can help them out with some basic things um, through the church office. So Joanne's job just got bigger, and um, so we'll, we will try to help with that. Um, but being the church means looking out for each other, and so please help us with that. If you do not have internet access, um, please let me or the church office know so that we can get information to you as we're getting it out on the internet to everybody else. So I know we have some folks who, who do not have computers or internet access, um, and we can give you a call or figure out some other way to get information out to you. Did I miss anything? Probably, but that's what we know right now. Again, um, you know, things, things are changing quickly. If um, the health, you know, the CDC and health departments and you know government um, changes their parameters for groups that are gathering and those kinds of things, we will adjust accordingly and let you know as soon as we possibly can. All right. One other note about worship that has nothing to do with viruses because we decided this before this all happened. We're not passing the offering baskets for the season of Lent. It's not about viruses, though. <laughs> Um, for us, it is in some other churches. But what we have decided to do for Lent is an experiment with our offering time, and that is to have um, the bowl here in the front on the table for your financial gifts if you bring them. If you give through automatic withdrawal from your bank accounts, that is fabulous. We greatly appreciate that. If you want um, a sign of your gift, there are offering cards in the black folders on the end of your row of chairs that you could use. You could drop one of those in the bowl. Or you could just, if you would choose to, um, pause by the bowl for a moment, maybe um, dip your hand in it kind of as a sign that you have given to God, um, but just in a different means. Are there questions? Um, not questions. Well, I know, okay, questions, sure. <laughs> I meant to say, is there anything else we need to let everybody know about? But I'll take questions as well for a moment. Okay. We are glad that you are here. We continue with our first song of the morning. And I invite you to stand as you're able to and join in singing.
Merciful God, whose ways are good and true. We confess that we have not lived as Christ has called us to live. We have shut our eyes to evils our world allows. We have sealed our ears from the cries of the suffering whose name we abide. We have clung to the hostility we harbor against one another. And hardened our hearts to the creative power of love. Therefore, we pray, open our eyes to see injustice in our world. Give us courage to resist the powers that oppress the poor. Open our ears to hear the cry of the needy. Teach us generosity for sharing the abundance of your creation. Open our minds to imagine an end to human strife. Grant us wisdom to pursue the ways of peace. Open our hearts to love our neighbors and our enemies near and far. Give us desire to embody the compassion of Christ. For the sake of the world, in the name of Christ, we pray. According to the Lord's abundant mercy, there is forgiveness for all who seek repentance and grace for all who turn their hearts to the way of Jesus. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Good morning. Kids, I'm sorry to say there's no children's sermon today, but I'll try to make this reading really interesting. <laughs> yeah, right? Our first reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. Because the thirsty Israelites quarreled with Moses and put God to the test, Moses cried out in desperation to God. God commanded Moses to strike the rock to provide water for the people. The double-filled question, is the Lord among us or not, received a very positive answer. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out to Egypt to kill us and our children and the livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go, I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it, so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Though we often hear that God helps those who help themselves, here Paul tells us that through Jesus' death, God helps utterly helpless sinners, since we who have been enemies are reconciled to God in the, in the cross, we now live in hope for our final salvation. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. 
Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, we will we be saved through him for the wrath of God. For if while we were sinners, or if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The gospel reading for today is rather lengthy, so uh, you may choose to remain seated if you prefer. But for those who are able, I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. <coughs> and this is the Holy Gospel according to John, chapter 4, verses 5 through 42. Lord, Glory Lord, to you, O Lord. Lord. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. 
Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say, Four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, 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 oh,
You may know that for the season of Lent this year, on Sundays, we're looking at two questions. Who is Jesus? And who are we as people who follow Jesus? So each week, we're looking at the gospel reading for the day and thinking about what it tells us about who Jesus is. And then in response to that, we think a little bit about what that means for who we are. Today we're going to focus on just the first part of our gospel reading. It's a long reading and there are lots of different things in it that we can talk about. I'm going to focus on the first part of Jesus' conversation with this unnamed Samaritan woman when they talk about living water. There are a couple of things that are helpful for us to know to help us better understand this story. One of which is that in the time and culture in which Jesus lived, the community well was like our local coffee shop or bar. It was where everybody went to share the news and to hang out and be together, especially the women, because it was usually the women's job to go to the well and get the water needed for the household for the day. Normally it was done early in the morning or in the evening when it was cooler, not in the heat of the day. So right away when our story starts out, it tells us it's noon. Usually not the time for people to gather at the well. We have this woman, whose name we're not told, who comes to the well. She comes at noon. We don't know why she's there at noon instead of when the other women were there. Maybe it's because for some reason she was not welcome when the other women were there, or maybe she chose not to be there with the rest of the group. Maybe she was shunned or embarrassed by her situation. My preferred reading, because it reflects me, is that she overslept that day, and that she was late in running all of her errands. But whatever the reason, the woman comes to the well, she needs to carry water back to her home. And there, where she would not expect anyone else to be at the well at noon, there's Jesus. Jesus always shows up where we do not expect him to be. He is sitting there, he is hot, he is tired, he is hungry and thirsty, he's been walking, they've been trekking across the desert in their travels. There's nobody else around. He asks this woman for a drink, and she doesn't know what to do. Now, giving him a drink isn't a problem. She has to get water anyway. He's not going to drink that much. They weren't worried about viruses. Um, but the problem is that he's a man, and she's a woman. Here's something else that's helpful for us to know. Men and women in that time and culture did not speak in public to each other, especially if they were not immediate family members. To top that, Jesus is a Jew and she is a Samaritan. And so these are two different religious and ethnic groups of people who did not interact. In fact, the Jewish people were often taught from childhood to go out of their way to avoid a Samaritan. Despite all of this, Jesus and this woman engage in this lengthy conversation. Jesus is thirsty in the desert heat. The woman is even more thirsty. Longing for something to fill up the holes in her life. Without this living water from Jesus, she's dried up and curled in on herself. Focused only on herself and her own survival. Like... These magic grow capsules. I realize you are too far away to see clearly what I am holding, and I would encourage you to come closer, but viruses. So, you have to use your imagination a little bit. Object lessons are not just for children. They are also for us, all of us. Okay, so these are tiny little gelatin capsules with dried up critters inside them. Not real critters, sponge critters. But the capsule surrounding the critter serves as a barrier. 
If we say the woman is like this capsule, then it's a barrier to full participation in life with others and with Jesus. For us, we could say that perhaps all our fears and insecurities wrap around us like this capsule wraps around the sponge critter inside. So, if we take a couple of these, oh, we want to use different colors and not the same colors, and add the living water that Jesus promises. Oops. And while we let that wait for a moment to see what living water can do, think about the woman at the well that day. I imagine that whether she was thinking about it that day or not, that she looks for things like peace and acceptance and validation. And for someone who loves her, though she is far from perfect, for someone with whom she doesn't have to pretend, but can be fully herself. For who she found in Jesus. Now the woman isn't afraid to engage Jesus in conversation. She's actually kind of spunky. She's not afraid to ask questions, to wrestle with answers, to look in the mirror that Jesus holds up to her and see the truth. She knows that she's an outsider. She's a woman, she's a Samaritan, and she's living with somebody who's not her husband. Now, something else that's helpful for us to know in that time and culture. Much has been made over the years of, of this woman who had five husbands and now she's living with yet another guy who's not her husband, usually with the implication that she's a woman of loose morals. However, we need to remember that in that time and culture, women were pretty much property. And being married five times was highly likely not her choice. Women had to have a man to survive. Either their father or a brother or a husband. That's just the way life was. We don't have to like it today, but that's the way it was then. It's highly likely that with that many marriages, she had either been widowed multiple times or divorced or a combination. And divorce in that time and culture would not have been her choice. She wouldn't have, any, have had anything to say about it, and she could not have initiated it. Only men could initiate divorce, and they could divorce for any reason, including what we would consider maybe more serious, like infidelity, two things as random and frivolous, to me at least, as not being able to cook, not being able to have children, and talking too much. Guys, don't get any ideas. So the situation that she is in is most likely not what she would have chosen for herself. Not her fault. Knowing all of that, and what that time and culture looked like, does not at all stop Jesus from, from offering her living water. It doesn't stop Jesus from knowing her, from talking to her, from accepting her less than perfect self, because none of us are perfect. It doesn't stop Jesus from telling her very clearly who he is. The first person in the Gospel of John, where Jesus said, Yep, I'm the Messiah. I'm the one you've been waiting for, is this woman. He is the Savior and the one she seeks and the one who can change her world. So the woman came to the well that day for water. She thought it was going to be an ordinary day. Jesus guides her into recognizing what she really needs and who can give it to her and prompts her to ask for it. This living water, it's powerful enough to wash away all our fears and insecurities. That capsule that surrounds us and separates us from others. 
so that we can be fully alive and free from fear, knowing and trusting that Jesus loves us just as we are. So here we go. Without living water, without Jesus, with living water, with Jesus. That's a snail in case you're trying to figure it out. <laughs> living water is what makes all the difference in the world. And it allows us to be fully and freely, entirely who we are and loved just as we are. Now, object lessons are no fun without take-homes. So, as a reminder of the living water of Jesus and the power that it holds, I have enough magic grow critters for all of you to have probably two um, this morning. They will be, yeah, yeah, so I've been playing with them all week, so um, <laughs> I will have them for you um, at the back on your way out of worship, so see me at the door if you would like some to take home. Safety reminder, please do not eat these. I feel like I shouldn't have to tell you this, but I also feel obligated like a teacher to you know, have to tell you these things. They might look like candy, but they are not. Please do not let your pets eat them. That will be very expensive because it will probably require surgery on your pet if you allow your pets to eat them. And please supervise younger children with them. Also, in an effort to help um, cut down on the spread of possible illness, please don't reach into the bowl to grab them for yourself. I will have freshly washed and sanitized my hands and will drop them into your hands for you. So who is Jesus? Which is our question for Lent. Jesus is the source of living water, the source of life. The one who connects us to God. The Messiah, the Savior. The one who loves you as, you're, as you are, even knowing everything you have ever done, as the woman at the well says. Who are we, then, as people who follow Jesus? Well, we are blessed to be the recipients of and conduits for this living water. We're not the living water ourselves, only Jesus is. But when we are connected to that source of living water, connected in relationship with Jesus, it flows into us and through us and overflows into the people around us. Let us pray. God of living water, pour out this living water on and into and through us. Help us to live secure and know, in knowing and trusting that we belong to you, so that the living water of Jesus flows through us to wash over the people around us. Amen. We continue this morning with our confession of faith. We're using the Apostles' Creed. I invite you to stand for this as you're able to. As together with the Christian church around the world, we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. 
He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join me in the prayers of the people. At the end of each prayer, I will say, Lord, in your mercy. Please respond, hear our prayer. God, our healer, we pray for all of those affected by COVID-19. We pray for those who are ill, for those who are anxious about becoming sick, and for those who have family members suffering from the virus. We also pray for anyone suffering with illness or injury of any kind, including Dave and Carol Farber, Ashton Fisher, and Mark as he recovers from an infection and starts chemo treatments this week. We ask for your protection for people recovering or facing um, any kind of medical procedure. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Protect your God, we pray for all those who work to contain the spread of the coronavirus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, we ask for strength and resilience for all who care for sick people. We pray for medical practitioners, for family members, and other caregivers. And we give thanks as well for our grace actors who are giving us the healing gift of laughter this weekend. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we pray for our leaders as they make difficult decisions about closing things, such as schools, businesses, and other large gatherings. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And gracious God, we pray for justice and peace in our world so that we can all work towards maintaining our health rather than fighting each other. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Today we pray especially for Steve Pressure and his family at the death of Steve's mother. We also pray for the people of grace, including Mike, Tricia, and Hadley Klein, Terry Lees, Mark and Shirley Domke, and Mike and Christine Sullivan. May they be growing in faith and love for you, God. And we also pray for all of us as our ways of relating to each other uh, have changed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray as well for our companion church, Holfantine Lutheran Church in the Republic of South Africa. Desert Streams Church in Surprise, Arizona, and for all our friends in Guatemala. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for children separ separated at the borders from their parents, for migrants, hungry, unemployed, and homeless people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And at this time, we take a few minutes of silence to pray for those whose needs we hold close to our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O Lord, trusting that you hear us. And may the peace of our Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us greet one another with a word of peace.
As we move to our celebration of, of Holy Communion, I am uh, reminded that there is an ancient liturgical rite in which the priests used to publicly and visibly wash their hands right before consecrating the elements. So we've lost that over the years, but maybe returning to that. But as we gather to celebrate Holy Communion, we share the story of Jesus and the disciples on their last night together before his death when he first taught us to do this. That night, Jesus was with the disciples for supper, and as part of their time together, he took bread, and he gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it for all of them, and said, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, Jesus took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And as we gather together to celebrate and share in this holy meal, we remember what Jesus taught us, and his life and ministry and death and resurrection for us. We also remember and use the prayer that Jesus taught as together we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. For those who are assisting with communion this morning, please come forward. And we do practice an open table here at Grace. That means that everyone is welcome and invited to receive Holy Communion. Once the servers are ready, we'll invite you to come forward using the center aisle in a double line. Please hold out your hand to receive the bread and then take one of the glasses from the tray. Use the side aisles to return to your seats. If there are children with us who haven't yet celebrated their first Holy Communion, they're welcome to come for a blessing. Children who have celebrated their first Holy Communion are welcome to receive the sacrament. I come to the cross seeking mercy and grace. I come to the cross where you died in my place. Out of my weakness and into your strength. Humbly I come to the cross. Your 
Do the best. 